Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times, and I would like to welcome you to today's program. It's called Project to Product, Connecting IT to the Business uh, with the Flow Framework. So before we start, I have just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one, uh, today's program is going to be followed by a live Q&A. So if at any point during the presentation you have a question, just go to the control panel, type it into the questions tab. We'll get to as many as time allows. Uh, secondly, this is being recorded, so it will be available on demand on sdtimes.com uh, probably within the next 24 hours or so. Okay, so uh, connecting IT to the business, that's about value stream management, and we've been writing a lot about that in S SD Times over the last year. And uh, one of the drivers of the concept is Dr. Mick Kirsten. He's the CEO of software provider Testop. Uh, he's the author of a book called Project to, Pro uh, Project to Product. Uh, and that book actually is launching today. And uh, he's here with us to share his ideas, thoughts, and some practical ideas. So how are you doing, Mick? Welcome. I'm doing well. Thank you, Dave. Good, good. So uh, we uh, saw each other at the DevOps Summit uh, earlier this year, and uh, we were talking, and I had a chance to talk to a lot of the attendees. And uh, part, of the, part of the problem that I think a lot of them have is just getting their head around what value stream means and what value stream management is. Uh, they hear the word uh, value and probably figure they're going to get some out of doing this, but they're not really sure what it means. It's kind of a nebulous concept to a lot of folks, so maybe you can... Uh, start this off by kind of giving us a definition. Yeah, absolutely. And I think th this this concept of value stream management, um, some of us have been working on it for a long time because we're looking at how to think more end to end. But it's I think it's exactly as you say, I think for a lot of attendees, a lot of people reading the the, the vlogs and watching the presentations out there, there's, there's this new nebulous concept. And what, one of the goals of the book was actually to define this of the of project to product and to say why it's important and why it's important to think in this way. So just to, in terms of definition, so the concept of a value stream is all of the end-to-end -end activities involved in bringing business value to the market through software. So everything it takes to do that. And it's a really important concept because when it, it the whole goal of the concept is to stop us thinking in terms of these silos. We've had a lot, for example, we've had a lot of, uh, over the last decade, maturation in agility and scaling agility. Uh, companies that have had success or have initiatives underway uh, with deploying agile frameworks, like scaled agile frameworks, Scrum of Scrums, Nexus, less that, and so on. Uh, but what I noticed through the process of doing the studying for the book in my own career experience is that when an organization deploys those things in a silo and for example just as agile from the point of view of software you know, just developers working on opening and closing user stories they can very easily fall into this this major pitfall which i think and i actually studied in the book um as one of the major uh pitfalls of of agile transformations is that it's localized you're only looking at optimizing the flow of value from basically user story open to user story closed to, to code commit. And then, of course, DevOps helps us bring that further to deploy. Uh, but we actually really need to think end to end. We need to think all the way from uh, the way that manufacturers do, all the way from a customer request, something that the market's pulling and end users pulling, maybe even an internal customer to your company's pulling, and how long it takes to get that to market. And I'll just, I'll just give you an example of thinking in terms of silos versus value stream thinking. Uh, if you're doing a transformation, you know, let's say you're a traditional business and you're looking at, you really want to make your mobile apps get out there faster, uh, you might have this knee-jerk reaction as I think many or most organizations have had, let's hire more developers, let's get Agile going, let's get CI, CD going. Uh, I've seen, I can't tell you how many organizations have seen do that and then at the tail end realize that their bottleneck was not the developers or their ability to deploy, but the fact that the ratio of UX, user experience designers, to developers is one to 100 or one to 200. Mm -hmm. And of course, they didn't realize that till too late because they're looking at optimizing a part of the value stream, such as the deployment pipeline, or such as how they do agile, um, rather than the end-to-end -end value stream. And to companies that have actually been going through these 
lean cycles and iterating all along. So you know, companies like the uh, tech companies, startups, unicorns, and so on, they've been at this long enough, they've actually managed to iron those things out. And their ratio of developers to designers is more like one to five, maybe one to 10, because they've just had the time. The problem is if we did approach our transformations with this local approach, let's do agile, let's do DevOps. We're not thinking of the value stream. We're thinking of making a segment of the value stream go faster. And we might be applying resources to the wrong place, not to the bottleneck. And the whole goal of lean thinking and theory of constraints that um, some of you may have heard of uh, is to actually make sure we optimize the flow end to end. And that's why I think elevating what we do from these very important practices around agile and DevOps to end to end thinking value stream management is critical to succeed with an adult with a with a with a transformation with any kind of digital transformation. And of course it needs to then dovetail with the agile practices, the DevOps practices, um, customer success practices and and other aspects of the value stream. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about project to product, I get it where you have a developer who might be working on his one little piece of work in an agile environment doesn't have the big picture view of things. So is is actually implementing a value stream and, and uh, managing that in an organization, uh, is that more of just a change in thinking or is there a change in process that needs to occur as well? Or how do you how do you get there? Yeah, I, I think it's it's both. It's a change in thinking and it's a change in process and it might be a new approach for tool, you know, in terms of tooling uh, oh. as well. So I think it, it's a combination of those things. But you know, let me show you. You know, I, could, I can show you an example of uh, like this, this illustration of what we've seen with this kind of localized thinking. Is if you go, you're doing your transformation, and you just decompose everything into your functional silos. Because one of the things that we have to acknowledge has happened is that we've had a ton of functional specialization in our organizations, and we need to because. A business analyst, a graphical designer, a marketing specialist, a product marketing specialist, a developer, um, an infrastructure administrator, those are different functions. They have different tools. And really, I think I've learned to appreciate just, just how much functional specialization there was, right? My background was from open source, where I got to do everything, right? I set up the delivery pipeline, I set up our deployments, I wrote the code, and it was beautiful, right? I was able to myself and you know with an army of contributors or a very small army <laughs> of contributors just be cranking and delivering value um in open source and it was wonderful and then of course as then i founded a company out of that and the company grew i got to learn that it takes a village uh to build software right that these specialized we can't have engineers do everything uh mm -hmm. because some engineers don't love living in Photoshop, just as one example. So other engineers don't are, are not great at providing the kind of legendary support that, that you might need as you scale, and so, and so on. So we have to recognize that we've got these functional specializations, and that's OK. That's great, right? You used to go 100 years ago to one doctor who would I don't know, attach leeches to you and help you feel that way. Um, but now you go to all these different specialists. But because the discipline of medicine has become much more complex. Right. But the issue with that is that the handoffs between the specializations then become the bottlenecks, right? We know that in the US, the, the actual handoffs of, from medical, the medical areas that come from handoffs are one of the leading causes of death in the country. Um, and it's because once you specialize they, and things are siloed and you can't transfer information in an automated and predictable and reliable way, say because you don't have some kind of robust electronic healthcare record transfer, um, then those those handoffs become the bottleneck. And that's exactly what I saw when I kind of dug under the covers and looked into 308 of, of our custom, of desktops customers' tool chains is that these handoffs were the bottlenecks, right? It wasn't that people couldn't work effectively in the agile tool. It was that the developers with the testers, with the ops people, um, with the people doing the, the planning on the business side, the business partners in the large organization, um, the, or the people with, within the lines of business, that's where all the inefficiencies were. And that's where things were grinding to a halt. So I just got this very visceral sense that, okay, these companies, they could hot, go and hire, let's say the company, you know, typical large IT shop, they have 1,000, 10,000 developers. They could go and hire double their developers and they'd get no more value because again that's not where their bottleneck is but leadership did not realize that so at the business level what i realized is we need a different tool for thinking 
because in the end, um, these, these tools that we have for thinking um, are how we manage organizations, right? We have one tool for thinking that's, that's worked for organizations for hundreds of years, and it's org charts. And this, the org chart tool of thinking, which is how a lot of business leaders do their planning and budgeting, um, is how we end up with silos. Because in the end, we need some functional specializations. We've, from the Agile community and, um, and the DevOps community, we, we've actually seen a push against that through things like feature teams, right? The whole point of feature teams is to have cross-functional specialization, because for some reason, uh, with software, that seems to get you better results in some cases, right? It's not siloing, but putting, putting different specialties onto one team. And I realized that, that we actually need to extend that concept. We need to give the organization, not just the people on the feature teams who just get this, they work this way, they love to work this way. Um, we need to give the organization a better tool than an org chart. And, but it actually needs to be bigger than a single feature team because you, there's only so much you can get done with you know, a feature team of five, 10, 12 people. So really, I think they need, there's, a, there's a new orga organizational construct here with what a value stream is. Um, and the value stream is, again, this, this kind of conduit, with this channel for delivering value to a customer, similar, similar to how you might do that in an assembly line, which is specialized for delivery of, you know, that picture I was just showing, of an I-8. And that's a very different kind of assembly line, production line, um, than you have for a high volume car, like a one or two series BMW. And the ability to specialize the kind of people, the kind of processes, and the kind of tools, to get back to your question, specific to that value stream turns out to be extremely powerful. So I think thinking of these value streams as a first class contrast is, is critical. And then, of course, once I made progress on that, I realized, okay, but there's this weird thing completely getting in the way of this kind of thinking, which is product management. Right. So it's not just org charts that are the enemy, and org charts are not really the enemy. We need org charts no matter what. They're just not the best tool for, becoming, for helping you become a software innovator. Um, uh, but there's this other thing that's even more problematic um, that, again, is a legacy of an old way of managing organizations that doesn't work for the age of software. Right. So when you talk about uh, flow, are you talking about uh, uh, managing a way of, of uh, getting rid of those bottlenecks and, and making the handoffs more efficient or breaking down the silos altogether and just having everybody work as one big happy team? Yeah. And so just at a, in the end, I think the really important thing about flow is that it has to be, if we, because in the end, we're trying to apply lean concepts to what we do, the stuff that worked in lean manufacturing. And some of the stuff doesn't apply to what we do because we're making intangible digital assets, right? It's a, it's a different thing, the products that we create. Um, but if we think about flow, I think it's, it's critical to think about flow from the customer's perspective. And so, you know, going back to, to what this was like in the age of manufacturing, I think, you know, we can draw some, some major inspirations, right? Lean principles are about flowing value for a product, right? This is taken directly out of the Lean Thinking book. These are the, the, the five lean principles from that book. Um, identifying the value stream for each product. So value streams and getting back to the definition, Value streams is just how value flows. We need to manage them, we need to create them, we need to make sure people working on them are happy and productive. Um, but again, core lean principle, the goal is flowing value without interruptions. And this is the key one, because then this actually determines what is pulled, um, letting the customer pull value from the producer. That's what lean manufacturing, that's what the elimination of waste is about, is you're focusing on a customer pull. And the fifth one that's, that's not listed here is pursuing perfection, right? You need to continue to sharpen the saw, um, as we've seen in this rising excellence through mass production that I think the software industry is just starting to, to enter into. So, you know, the question purely becomes, and again, in, in my search for finding a new tool of thinking that would do away with how we think about delivering software today and managing it as projects, um, how we would take the spirit of what we've already learned in Agile, what we've already learned in Lean, because Agile and Lean were, by, by the way, they were never meant to be these local optimizations, right? The people, people pushing Agile and Lean did want to influence the business, right? They did, they were thinking end to end. It's just the way it gets applied uh, tends to be limited in this way. So, you know, for me, the entire exercise was how do we, how do we create a tool that 
allows the, especially the business leaders creating these organizational structures to understand and manage the things that the technologists know already. Um, and because the technologists, you know, if, you, if you're writing code, if you're one of the people making the contributions, you know what building value is. It's, it's when you create a great feature that a customer loves, right? You felt like you've made an impact. You felt like you've done something, something good. This is that kind of flow um, is what your career is all about. So I was thinking, how can we capture this at a higher level? We've got these kind of agile frameworks. We've got, let's say, a very rich taxonomy and safe scale agile framework for the kind of the work that we do. But how can we make this more obvious, more understandable at the business level so that we can give our, our business leaders um, a tool better than org charts, better than project management for creating and nurturing and supporting these value streams and in the end actually budgeting um, around these value streams. So it goes back to you know the answer to this question, Dave, which is what flows? How do you get what, there? <laughs> yeah. Um, I will eventually answer this question. <laughs> so um, what flows in software delivery? And it's, I think, from this overly manufacturing mindset, we sometimes think that you know what flows is the releases that we create, right? Like we're pushing out releases. Um, and it certainly used to be that way when we were manufacturing physical shrink wrap boxes with CDs in them, right? But right. in the age of cloud and continuous delivery, that just makes no sense. No one's really consuming releases. I, I no longer care how many releases there have been of my apps on the phone. I'm just consuming value. But the, I do care if some cool new feature was added to you know, a news app that I use every day um, that makes things a bit easier for me. And I definitely care if a defect was fixed for that thing. right? And I probably care if it's they just had that that organization just had a major security breach, right? So as a, as an end user, I can think of those things as as a kind of value, um, and I really care if that company has not been able to update their app at all, unlike some other apps, because they've got so much technical debt they can't even make changes. So these units of flow, these flow items. Um, in the flow framework, and these are at the very core of the, flow, of the flow framework. We've got features, which are new business value that's pulled by the customer, right? Those are the things that we love to consume as end users of software. Um, they're defects, uh, the fixes that we need to see in order to be, to be productive with the software and applications and products that we use. Then the risks. So you need to prioritize work on the risks to make sure that your customers, your end users, are secure and their use of the software that your company is secure, your organization is secure. And those will be pulled by the, by the business, by the risk officers, by the compliance officers, and so on. And they're debts, because we've learned from Ward Cunningham, from others, uh, just how fundamental um, technical debts are to the way that software evolves over time, to how software architecture can, say, deteriorate, if not given a chance for refactoring and re-architecture. And so this, this actually is the core of the full framework, that these these four flow units are mutually exclusive and comprehensive exhaustive, which means that if as you know, a business direction and North Software company has so much focus on features, you're taking away from risk, work on risks and technical debts, right? You're, you're not giving yourself the, or you're not giving your teams, the, the people working on your value streams, the time to work on, on those things. And that there's this very critical balance that tech companies and companies with software developers at the head of them, say like the tech giants, which each of them has someone who was a software developer at one point in their career, more innately understand, but that today's enterprise IT organizations just have not had the, the, the business level tools to understand. And that's really the whole goal of the flow framework is to provide the, the business leaders with these tools to basically set up their value streams and to focus on the flow of value through those value streams, and then to know how to measure that flow and its correlation to business results. So, um, yeah, I was just going to ask cool. how you how you actually measure the uh, the success of the flow and uh, and the business value that you're gaining from IT. Yeah. yeah, and so I think fundamentally, what we're trying to do is deliver value to customers. Right, we're trying to deliver value through running software, through features that delight our end users or protect our end users, and and so on. Um, so the flow framework has, an, and you, see, you can see this in the in the top right here, this focus on business results, like the, for that for each value stream. And again, the goal we've not talked much about this yet, but you've got to set up your value streams the way that the customers are pulling them, both internal and external customers. Um, and that's per product, not per project. It's 
per product. People pull, consume things per product. You can call it application, you can call it different things, but they're products, not projects. For each of those products, the business needs to identify what value is via the full, full framework. That value might be revenue. That value might be daily active users, right? That value for an internal developer tool that you just created might be adoption of that tool or a new billing system or, or some piece of infrastructure or SDK. Um, you need to measure cost per value stream, the quality per value stream, and then the happiness of the staff working on that value stream because we know happy people build better software. Um, so those are kind of the outcomes, the business outcomes. And then it really becomes a question of how you m measure and in the end actually optimize for flow to maximize those outcomes. And so the flow framework has taken, and this, is, this builds on a lot of literature, for example, from Donald Reinenstein's product development flow and from Dominica de Grandis' work and, make, and making work visible and, and a lot of other work in applying some of the things that worked in Lean, such as queuing theory and tracking work in progress, um, to software. And it tries to fix a couple things. For example, uh, the fact that one of the main measures of efficiency in manufacturing, which is lead time, and the correlation that has to automotive manufacturer performance doesn't quite work the same for software. Because if you're a popular software shop, you can't track the time from every customer request because you know Apple has an infinite number of customer requests that they're never going to fix, right? right. Um, when I was working in open source, we probably had 10 to 20x the number of bug reports than we would ever fix, right? This is the thing with, with open source projects. Yeah. Um, but flow time, if we actually focus on value stream flow, from when the team accepts that, the organization accepts that as something that is meaningful to their end users, the flow time clock starts. And the flow time clock stops when you've got that thing running. Um, it, uh, you know, running in the cloud, running on your customers' mobile devices, and so on. So we're able to basically take these flow concepts and track them at the value stream level in order to understand where the bottlenecks are. Is flow time being slowed down uh, because it's taking, you know, you've got a change advisory board that's not letting you release anything or the, the, because they're manual build steps or verification steps? Um, or is, it being, is flow time being slowed down because you don't have enough upfront analysis and you're doing a bunch of rework on features, which is a more sophisticated, sophisticated issue, but it's a, it's a very real one that, that I've noticed in many organizations. Or is flow time being slowed down because you've got a value stream dependency because you didn't extract a common framework or API that you should have. And so developers are always waiting and hiring more of them won't help until you actually invest in creating that common platform. So these simple four metrics allow us to, you know, to answer those questions again by focusing on that end-to-end -end flow rather than just going and asking developers, well, you know, why were you stuck and so on, right? We, that, that, that approach just, just doesn't scale properly. This gives us a, a business level of visibility of where to focus our attention, our investment, in order to make it possible for our teams, our people, um, to do great work. So. Right. so you've talked a lot about the process part of it. It was kind of a two-part question I asked earlier about uh, whether it's a change in process or a change in culture. So we've talked a lot about process, but now how do you actually get people to buy into this and understand that their jobs may change and the way they do things might change? How, how do you do that successfully? Yeah, so I, and it's, this has been interesting. So I've, I, I've worked with so many organizations who are having trouble with their large scale transformation and the fingers instantly pointed at culture. Mm -hmm. Now, that can be the case sometimes that people, you know, might not have the right mindset from working the old way and so on. But to me, that's actually, in my experience, that's, that's been the exception where if you allow people to do great work and you have them connected to how that work delivers and produces value, then those people all of a sudden will actually become more productive when most of the work is value added, when they're not wasting their time in a gazillion status update meetings, but instead are more in brainstorming meetings and, and in value creating activities. Right. So I think the culture stuff is important, but the flow framework just takes this approach that, uh, and Project to Product, is, the book takes this approach that if we can just allow these people to take the waste out of their day, those annoying parts out of their day, allow them to work with the right team structure, which is a cross-functional value stream oriented structure, mm -hmm. not a silo oriented structure. So they're always waiting on someone else to do their work because that's one of the issues. And that's why flow efficiency is such an important metric. It actually tracks 
how much wait time there is for any artifact, like a feature, flowing through the value stream, any of these flow items. Um, that if we take out the waste, we actually give ourselves a chance to, for the culture focus, such as training people, such as giving the, them the opportunity to learn from others, such as doing dojo, DevOps dojos, those kinds of things, that those will have a better and more quick effect because we'll be taking away you know, one of the most fundamentally difficult parts of their day. And, and think of the, because I've, I've certainly seen this, um, think of the, the, the flip side of this, right? You've got all these people, you just, you know, you just brought in the, the best and most inspirational, transformational um, uh, DevOps agile thinker into your organization. You just inspired everyone just how great this is. Then they go back to their laptops and it takes them three months to ship a feature to a customer that they get zero feedback on because the value stream is not connected. There's not a flow in a feedback loop. That just doesn't work. You just probably demotivated um, that person more because right. in the end, again, we need, it's, we, we get as so software professionals, we get our satisfaction for, from delivering value through software. And this, the flow framework is really all about making sure that that value flows can flow without interruptions. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the top level, how you implement that across your processes and your tool chains. That's really this, this bottom level of the flow framework. Right. So one of our attendees actually uh, commented that he loves the fact that you uh, weave in the human element of happiness into the uh, measurement results, because that is, of course, uh, you know, one of the keys to delivering value is if you have happy workers, they'll be more willing to buy into the process and, and work harder and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And this this was, you know, I've been working on and at Tastop using and with our customers using various aspects of, of the flow framework for two years. This this was that happiness aspect was the most recent addition and to me kind of the the most interesting one at first you know this thing needs to work for you know, CIOs and company executives and so on and for a while I worried that you know this is going to be feel too fluffy that there's the happiness and the smiley face <laughs> right right on this whole framework but amazingly even from CFO types who've looked at this um, there's there's I think that there's just been a unanimously positive response how important this is we can't just measure the the net things like the net promoter score of our customers we need to help our staff right we need again if there's a culture bottleneck you know somewhere you need to see that for the value stream um because again the great software is built by by people who are happy and productive and who feel like you know you're investing in, in their growth and their mastery so the the big lesson it was it was over a year ago that i started talking about this with with john smart because we were both measuring nps and and uh john smart was at barclays at the time um and He's, I was just thinking our NPS scores at Tastop, there was, there's just something missing in them because if there's an NPS problem, it was very, it took so many conversations to figure out really what, what the roots of that problem were, right? Um, or where really it was, was it coming from this team, waiting on this team? Was it coming from just the weird interaction between the product management side or the engineering side or you know, someone in sales pushing or pulling too hard? What was it? Um, and so, I switched things over because again, we were measuring net promoter score. This was dawned on me and I felt like I should have realized this years ago. Um, but I tried to follow all the best practices from, you know, from my mentors and advisors on measuring net promoter score, um, which of course was measuring it for the org chart, right? You measure the happiness of your salespeople, your marketing people, your account, you know, your people in operations, your people in engineering, your people in product management, your people in, in support and customer success and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So I realized we've tried to orient with the flow framework, the whole organization to value streams, but we're not measuring the happiness of our value streams. We don't know if this particular product value stream is unhappy because they've piled up tons of technical debt and we've not given them any time. The leadership of the value stream is not giving them any time to take down that debt. Well, of course they're going to be miserable, right? Of course they're going to be asked to deliver more you know, while fixing defects, while not having the chance to remove the, the the causes of those defects in the first place, which is too much technical debt. And so we switched over um, almost a year ago to measuring employee net promoter score, which is our measure of happiness for our staff, um, and, a, and a really critical one to me, um, per value stream. And mm -hmm. it was amazing, right? It was instantly visible where the problems were because one product value stream will have a very high NPS, 
one will have a much lower one, of, and, and the lower one, you can actually start looking at why. Why is that? And it's amazing how many times I've now, because we do this regularly, how many times we've been able to hone in and actually give that team, more, you know, do things like give that team more time to, to reduce technical debt. Or in some cases, just say, look, we've got to make it to that release, right? This is a critical release, but the relief is coming after that release. And just admit, admit to the team that th this isn't going to be a difficult time. Um, because this this is such an important you know deliverable that the whole company is is hinging on is you know that that next new product launch or whatever that might be, um, but I think basically connecting the happiness of the staff to delivery is critical, and I think the, the key um, realization in the flow framework that's captured in the flow framework is you can't do it for the silos. You need to measure it for. The, the designers, the business analysts, the, the developers the, um, for the value stream, not slicing them up. Because in the end, they're the ones collaborating on this flow of value. If you've got a very, let's say, a bad relationship between the op side and the dev side for a value stream, you need to know that. And, and this is back to where the cultural stuff, I think, sometimes takes us for a tailspin because chances are it won't be in the whole organization, right? It'll be in this one place you're trying to move really fast. And right. then you need to shift the mindset of someone who's, I don't know, you know, too, too averse to change. But it's in that spot. It's not the whole company. So again, the whole point here is like, this gives us a way of looking mm -hmm. at those value streams so that we know where to, you know, where to, in the end, help our staff. So most companies then probably struggle with uh, completing the value stream because pretty much every one of them, the developers and IT people are clashing. So yeah. <laughs> that's... So I'm not saying this is a quick change um, yeah. in some organizations, right? But if you're directionally heading towards this and your discussions are no longer, uh, you know, just all about which agile tool do we implement, which service that's, do we move to, but how do we start to identify what our value streams are and look for bottlenecks, say through these flow metrics, which in the end identify those bottlenecks, mm -hmm. you will end up with happier staff, right? It can be a very long journey. But again, I think the, the expectation of, of throwing tools and Agile and DevOps at people, um, just at the org chart, expecting it to stick and things to get better, it, it just doesn't work. Um, so yeah, I think, again, in the end, the, these organizations need a new tool to do that. And then even though for some it might be a long journey in terms of you know, connecting those value streams, as long as you're starting, and again, as long as you're doing things like actually defining what your products are, um, mm -hmm. defining and, and starting to measure things like um, employee net promoter score, the happiness of the people working on those value streams. Um, and in the end, allowing the organization to reverse that Conway's law of functional silos, which don't work for software, right. and move towards value stream, product value stream orientation, which does work for software, you'll start seeing results. Right. So I want to take this time now just to remind our attendees that if they have any questions, they should uh, start typing them in now into the uh, questions tab in the control panel, and we'll uh, jump on them as we can. But speaking of happiness, uh, I understand your book launched today. So uh, what's what's been going on with that? Uh, yeah, I've been. Very, <laughs> I am very happy that the book launched today. Uh, I'm super happy to all the all the people that 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 helped make this happen. It's a it's a long list of people I just posted on LinkedIn who uh, whose ideas, whose help, whose collaboration made all of this possible. Um, and the publisher IT Revolution has has been amazing as well. So yeah, I was I was actually like midnight last night. I saw it appear on my iPad. So that was a, that was a really cool moment. And it's actually laid out quite nicely on the iPad, which is neat. So um, I have one here. I've got I've even got a physical one. So there it is. Um, but yeah, it's you know I think it's 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 been this really interesting journey. That the feedback to, on the book so far has been great. It's it's been amazing to see it become a bestseller in its categories prior to release. So I think there's, it's definitely hitting um, a nerve. And again, my my hope is that it doesn't only hit the nerve. It gives leaders on the business and technology side um, a tool for how to approach making that transformation successful. And really importantly, a, a common language, right? Because it's not that the technologists at these companies have not understood all this stuff. That's, again, that's not the issue. Um, in the way they approach Agile, they probably did understand. The way they're approaching DevOps now, they, they do understand it. It's that we need a common language between the business, kind of the organizational structure, the investment, the budgeting side, 
um, the cost tracking side and technology. And the, the old way of approaching IT with project management and these, these, these project budgets, it gets in the way of that. And, and mm -hmm. we, we just need a new tool. And for many organizations, and this is a point the book makes, is um, you can't afford you know, more of the wrong model driving your transformation it's because the urgency is getting higher, right? The, the rest of the industry is not waiting. Companies are figuring this out. Disruption is accelerating at a you know it's at this really impressive rate, um, and uh, and again I, I really hope that this does help um, not just a few companies who've already figured this out. With for tech startups, it's quite easy because they're small. So having connected value streams is actually very easy if you've got ten or twenty people. Um, the, the 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 larger digital native companies, a bunch of them have figured this out. They, they, they will struggle maybe some at larger scales, but in the they've grown up around optimizing these value streams because they've grown them from the ground up um, as have the tech giants. But we need the rest of the economy, the rest of our organizations, to become software innovators as well. And and so I'm really hopeful that that this book helps. That's great. That's great. All right, we've uh, got some questions coming in now from the folks. So uh, why don't we get right to those? Uh, one of them is, uh, is the flow framework capable of adapting to agile sprints? Uh, it seems that this is more of a waterfall methodology. How would you describe uh, it? Yeah, so no, the the flow framework is basically, it's all about this this flow orientation. There's no, it, it is all about agile sprints. So um, I'll give you a, a, an illustration, but basically in this project, the, the core problem that I've seen with a lot of adoption of Agile is what you know Dave West started calling it at one point a few years ago is water scrum fall. Mm -hmm. And where you've got this project management as the way to manage budgets for these one or two year software projects. And in the middle of that, you stick some Agile and now you stick some Agile in DevOps, right? Um, you're not measuring business value delivery incrementally. You're delivering user stories incrementally which is good, um, but the business is not learning, is not hypothesis testing, is not finding product market fit incrementally. So the whole point of the flow framework is this going away from having an agile process and sprints in the middle of a waterfall process. Uh, and basically the way you do that is you're looking for ways of optimizing the end-to-end -end flow across these value streams because you know, we see these things from things like the um, state of DevOps report and so on, is that when you start achieving flow, it correlates to performance. So you're seeking things like for a new feature, um, it's not just how quickly developers coded the screens that they were given. It's what was the end-to-end -end flow time of that feature. Because if you can get to a two or four week flow time from a feature being designed to being deployed, that's pretty amazing, right? And of course, at that point, you'll actually need continuous delivery, and you'll need to be able to deploy multiple times a day to be able to iterate that quickly. Um, and you might need blue-green deployments and all those other important practices. But really, you know, you, you, if you focus in on, at a large organization, uh, reducing that flow time, and of course, for severe defects, you might need a flow time of hours um, in order to resolve things. But it allows you to take those concepts that we're familiar with in sprints, such as that fast two-week iteration, and apply them end to end to the business, and they get and go away from basically wrapping agile. And again, this is I think one of the failure modes: wrapping agile um, in project management and waterfall. So here's just another illustration of that, right? Where for this product value stream, um, you're actually looking at making decisions such as should we add more developers? Should we add should we you know should we add more just more people, um, more investment into this value stream because it's producing great results? You're not doing that every budget cycle. You're doing that every sprint, every month, every quarter, however quick your business planning is. So it's actually taking that notion of a sprint um, and extending it right to the business side. Excellent. Okay, another attendee wants to know that, uh, it makes the point that value stream starts with a business value on one end. Uh, can you talk about task tops way of coming up with a value stream and actual value that they bring because it's not always a financial gain? Or is it? Okay, I'll try to um, unpack that question. But so 
for the person asking it, please, please uh, elaborate if I've missed anything. Um, so there's, first of all, there's this notion of the flow framework, which is bigger than task type. It's meant to be bigger than any vendor. It's, it's a way of thinking, right? It's a, it's a framework that's meant, meant to give you a business tool, however you implement it. Um, to implement this end-to-end -end flow, this measurement of business value, um, what we need is to have a connect, to have the equivalent of a production line, but a production line that works for creative work, not for completely automated or largely automated car production, right? So where Tastoff has come at this as a, as, a, as a tool vendor, as an infrastructure tool vendor, is we've made it possible for you to connect the different tools in your tool network, you know, your, your, your Jira's, your ServiceNow's, your Azure DevOps, all those, all that tool chain, um, so that you can get flow and feedback. And then on top of that, you can get these layers of visibility. So that's the whole goal is in the end, you're just connecting people but recognizing that different people use different tools, um, that there are specialized support tools that developers don't love and that developers don't tend to love the specialized support tools, right? They're, they're more around having flow in Git than they are around having flow through fast churn on, you know, uh, responses on tickets and SLAs. Um, so the, in the end, again, once you've got that connected, however you connected it, right? Maybe you implemented all this yourself on top of all the all the web service APIs of all the tools. Um, the key thing is then that you're actually measuring value, and the measurement of value in the flow framework is all up to you, right? In the end, you might how you measure value for a particular product value stream. It's all up to you and all up to your organization. And actually how you set the flow distribution in the end should be the responsibility of the value stream team, right? That should not come top down. You should say the leadership, the engineers, the developers, the product managers and so on, on a particular value stream should say, we can deliver the most value for our customers, for our business by implementing all these features or by reducing debts for six months so that we can build all this cool stuff next year or by moving ourselves to a cloud native platform because in the end that's going to, that's what's going to increase our velocity going forward. So the definition of value is all meant to come from the people doing the work, the people delivering the value, and how that rolls up to, to these business results. So I'd like to stop there, though, and, and just check if that's, that's answered the question, both on those sides of um, how connecting all this is important and the vendors, like the, the tool vendors that provide you with the tools for your tool network and the vendors like TaskUp who connect the tool network and give you visibility on the tool network. Um, and then the the kind of value side. Is it just money? Um, again, that's up to you. It could be revenue, but it could just be happy users. Hey, Mick, what if we use the example of the automotive assembly line to perhaps elaborate on this point a little bit? Uh, to me, when I think of cars on an assembly line, to me, that seems completely like a waterfall process where the car comes down, now I put the doors on, it moves along, somebody puts the glass in, it moves along, somebody drops the motor in. So where are they finding a value stream there and what is their flow and how is that working out? Yeah, so I think what we've noticed, and I think this is where manufacturing and software differ tremendously. So the in terms of lean manufacturing, um, it's a sequential process, which yes, I think Dave, you, you can correct characterize as a, I think it's a little different than the, it's a flow focused process, but it's sequential. So it feels a bit like waterfall. I think it's actually a little bit different with waterfall. And let me, let me elaborate why. So let, let's look at how flow happens at this BMW plant. So first of all, again, there's this notion of value and the value everyone at that plant shares in this notion of value. This is actually a really culturally was an amazing thing that everyone understood value. And it's actually one of the things I hope the flow framework does is that everyone in your organization has a shared notion of value of how the products you create, the digital experiences, deliver value to your customers. For BMW, it's these cars that come off the line and deliver sheer driving pleasure. If the car squeaks, it does not deliver sheer driving pleasure. If you're driving on a bumper road and it's squeaking, right? That's, that's something that that's negative value. So I actually got to drive away off the end of the assembly line when they visit this plant with one of the engineers responsible for rattle and squeak, which is really interesting because his entire specialty is understanding rattle and squeak in cars because then they will take those fixes back and put them into the line um, if they discover any rattle and squeak through simulations, um, also through physical driving. So everyone gets this. And here's where things start to diverge. These cars 
are designed in yearly cycles, but they're delivered every 70 seconds, right? That seems a little different than what we do in software because for them, the design process and the manufacturing process are actually decoupled um, and they flow sequentially, which is why I think, Dave, you've got some of that waterfall feeling. It is the sequential batch flow that's going on. Um, it's a bit more complex when you in include all the suppliers and feedback loops that they have, but in the end, on the production line, it's a batch flow. So in IT and software, it looks a bit more like this, right? We need to deliver new features that delight our customers um, and products that do, but we design them in daily or weekly cycles. So that's completely different. And this is where I think, by the way, when I started this, I was trying to make the flow framework be much more linear because I thought it'd be simpler. And I realized, okay, we don't have a value stream manufacturing line. We don't have, what's the, the most important thing is not a continuous delivery pipeline. Those are all these linear processes. Um, what we have is the creative process and the manufacturing process being one. So if you imagine this, laying this out as a data structure, as we actually do, um, it's this graph and business value like feature delivery flows through that graph and it's people and teams that create that value before it flows to the next thing. And it's not a batch process, it's actually a network. So this is, this is the, the, the fundamental difference is that the way we have, to, and this is why that's such a key part, we don't have to spend too much time over here. The book goes into depth on this. We have to create our value stream network and then optimize those value stream networks for the flow. And the flow is intrinsically tied to the, kind of the, the, an effective and happy structure um, for our people and our teams because it's those people doing the work. Anything that can be automated will be at some point, right? All the build process, all of those checks, all security scanning, all of that should and will over time get automated. So all we should focus on in these value stream networks is these teams doing the creative work and the handoffs, the dependencies between the teams and really what this value stream network looks like, so. That was great. Yeah, that uh, certainly cleared up a lot of things for me and I hope for the attendees as well. Uh, so we have another question uh, and that is, um, has TaskTop implemented the flow metrics for the TaskTop Hub product? And if so, can the definitions of the business results be discussed? Yes, sure. So we have implemented the, yeah, uh, the flow metrics. I think they're critical. I am going to, I'll give you an illustration to make this a bit more concrete. Um, so here are, we've got, uh, so, sorry, one sec, let me clear this up a little bit. Um, we have basically, we have many of these product value streams that we manage, right? And different value streams have different notions of value. Some, for a software company um, selling software, value will be the, in the end, the exchange of value with a customer, which tends to be dollars, right? For a company creating and having an indirect monetization model through advertising, value will be monthly active users or daily active users. Um, which you monetize through advertisers, right? So we've absolutely defined the value for these things. And you can actually see this on our own flow metrics dashboard. I've excluded the revenue numbers, but it's a life cycle revenue number for this product, for this product, and so on, right? So we know the life cycle revenue of each of these. Um, we know the cost of each of these. Here we track them at this level, just at the number of, of people working there. So I can see there's 22 um, staff on this value stream and two co-ops, right? And already here, what we can see is what Donald Reinerston wanted for our industry in product development flow, that the number one focus should be lifecycle profitability of products in order for organizations to, to build great things, right? Here, I can see if we've got a dated product that we can't deliver much dated stack, um, as we actually had through some of our Eclipse technologies that we had to replatform basically, right? It's, it's that kind of thinking that allowed us to, to do this, that we're putting all this, need on that software platform to create new features, but the platform itself is not good enough, right? It doesn't allow us to move quickly enough, which for us meant years ago, we had to move to web native technologies, like a lot of other organizations do or are in the process of doing. So absolutely, this insight for value stream, the fact that the happiness on this value stream is lower because they've had so much more work in progress, which again, Dominic the Grandest would warn your organizations about, um, but you can actually see it here. And when you can see it, not just for one or two value streams, but in the large organizations across dozens or hundreds, it becomes this really powerful tool, again, of doing the things that management's meant to do, which is to, to help 
uh, invest in areas that get out of the, the get impediments out of the way of doing of people do great work. Or in this case, of having put say too much feature load on a team that needed to focus on other kinds of work, like the tech debt reduction, because it built so much tech debt out from a prior release, right? Um, so again, the, the idea is to, to give these tools that allow us to, to understand how we can deliver the most value, whatever that value metric is, mm -hmm. whether it's dollars, um, whether it's it's happy users, whether it's satisfied users, it'll depend on your business model and your organization. Great. Okay, so we're coming up to the hour, uh, but before we do that, I think uh, another question that people are uh, interested in knowing about is how does their organization get started building out value streams and starting the cultural change? Yeah, so I think you know, the most important thing is you can start, the way I look at it is you can start, depending where you are within your organization, you can start at the top or at the bottom of the flow framework, right? You can start at connecting the different teams that you've got, making sure they're collaborating. Um, and that's a great place to start. Or you can start at the top. And starting at the top means you're defining your product value streams. And then you start looking at measuring things like the happiness, the value, the quality of those product value streams. And then, of course, that means you need to make sure that people are connected, that people are, you know, have an effective team structure and so on. But right. basically, and the, the book provides some of the guide. We've got some additional materials on this as well. Um, and, and some people who can help uh, with these kinds of transformations. Um, Carmen Diardo has been doing it, helping me a lot with, with an organization, a lot with, with work on this kind of thing is the steps for getting started. But fundamentally, either start at the bottom, start connecting um, the different teams and stakeholders. Um, or start at the top, which then will, of course, will drive you down to connecting and getting these end-to-end -end flows. Um, top is really defining what the what the products and value streams are. Bottom is really connecting the practitioners. Both right. need to happen, but there are these different starting points. Right. So, so are you sharing people across the value streams, or are each people still? Never. Oh, great question. Thank you. Never. So never share people across the value streams. I mean, if you have to share a UX des a graphical designer now and then, not the end of the world, right? But the idea is that no person works on two different value streams. This goes completely against the, this autonomy and mastery and purpose that Dan Pink and others taught us, right? Developers, software, spe all the kinds of software specialists need the time to master their value streams. You can move them between value streams. If someone turns out to be great at um, working on highly uncertain technical problems, but you've got them on a, um, you know, your core product and performance is the biggest need on the core product or stability. Okay, you might have a mismatch between that person's, you know, um, what that person's great at and the value stream they're on. So move people between value streams to 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 help, you know, uh, maximize for for their um, satisfaction and and delivery, but never split people across value streams. Good rule of thumb. And again, that's the the old project mentality is to assign people to five, six, I've seen 15 different projects, right? Some of them are legacy, problems still come up on them. So bring bring work to the people, not people to the work. That's great, great. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll ask you now just maybe for one uh, final thought, if, uh, you know, for our attendees who are here today, what, what the prime takeaway uh, should be, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so I think the, the key thing is if, if this resonates, um, we are, that this flow framework and the community around it will be this, you know, there'll be an evolving body of work and expertise and people helping organizations, providing them support and services in, in, in these transformations. So we have set up this flowframework.org website. It's just a starting point. But if you're interested in this, this is where we plan to grow the community around people trying to bring these practices and this new way of thinking into organizations. So you know, please feel free to, to, to reach out, to stay in touch, because you know, our goal is, is to grow this community. Um, we're having a task up is hosting an event on NDC on, on December th uh, 3rd to help bootstrap this community. So you can reach out about that, but it's really meant to be bigger than any single vendor. And again, this, this community of people who want to help the organizations achieve flow. So uh, check out that website, get in touch. And again, I think um, we want to create this body of, of practices, of documentation on answering some of these questions that you asked Dave and helping really um, move the industry forward. Great. Well, Mick Kirsten, CEO of TaskTop, author of Project to Product, 
Thanks so much for your time today, Mick, and thanks for uh, sponsoring this uh, presentation today. And I uh, certainly want to thank all of our attendees for hanging in there for the hour and um, appreciate uh, your time as well. And uh, once again, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times. And until the next one, so long, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody.